What's up? This is the almighty Cypress Hill in the smoke box. DJ Muggs, Sandorg, Eric Bobo, and myself. We're about to light this bitch up right now. What up? Bobo from the mighty Cypress Hill. Check out the smoke box. What up, Sandorg, Cypress? Check us out. The smoke box. Yeah. What's up? What's up? This is Muggs from Cypress Hill. Check out the smoke box. Come on. Welcome to another adventure in the smoke box. Um, I'm Dr. Green Thumb, AKA Be Real, with my bandmates, with my bros, the legendary Cypress Hill, what's happening, what's happening? DJ Muggs, yeah. uh, Send Dog, and um, my man Eric Bobo. And we're here because we are celebrating 30 years of our Black Sunday album. And congratulations, gentlemen. Yeah, my fellas, congratulations. We're still here. We still here, and I'll tell you, it's it's crazy because the way the way that album came together, I you know I didn't anticipate it being it having the impact that it did. But I remember we were on tour a lot at the time, you know, doing a lot of promo shit. But then we started to get a little bit paid, <laughs> and so we were on the road a little bit. And I guess. I don't know how long how long we had been on the road, but I remember Sony hitting us up, telling us you got to get off the road and get in the studio and make the album because Quick. the deadline was coming up. Right? We had like two or three months to turn in the next album in terms of our option. Right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, you decided. Well, I think we did two or three songs here in, in L.A. and then you decided let's go to New York and do this. Yeah, I know we did hits from the bong out here. We did um, shit goes down. Those are the early recordings yes. when we had first started. Right. Then we was in New York and we started just working, doing our demos like we always worked on the four track at the house and got our sketches down. And I think it was a month where we pretty much did everything. Then the rest of the time was going into the big studio and recording and mixing. So right. within two and a half months, the record was done. Yeah, we knocked it out pretty fast. Which was crazy because the first record was like three years. It was our whole life yeah. leading up to that first record. The next record was quick. It was kind of odd for me because at that time I wasn't making beats so fast. I was like, man, if I can make one hit song a month, I got 12 hit records a year. You know what I mean? So I was just take the time, the time yeah. keep molding the record, molding it, working on it, working on it, changing shit, getting it right. So this is the first time we had to produce right now. So that was some new shit, you know, right. just be on the spot and get that shit done. What 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 made you decide like to to change the vibe from doing it in L.A. and going to New York? I never asked you that. I, I always welcomed it because I loved uh, being in New York. So. You know, just I always loved the New York energy, man, and, and what it brought. Back then, L.A. was still a little bit slow for me, man. Um, just being in that New York energy and be able to walk in Manhattan and just to feel the vibe of that shit and just be able to harness that and put that energy into the music. And I think that's something that always separated our music from traditional west coast stuff because we always had that new york energy in our music you Absolutely. know what i mean yeah and you guys would always come to new york and kick it with me and just get in that vibe and bringing it back and at that time it was kind of like a hack because motherfuckers wasn't be able to go there and see things because yeah. if you saw anything it might have been on a video channel or in a magazine which was months and months and months later but right to, to be there while shit was while the pulse was pulsing and to be on the spot you know it was it was a special time man that, that was the thing you know like w i think Sen and I had had a uh, that that sort of plug in with you that that put us ahead of a lot, a lot of folks because we were hearing what was coming out of the East Coast via what you were bringing and showing to us. Like just for instance, like Style Wars, we would never have caught on to that mm. until much later, unless and you know if it wasn't for you showing us making that, up, making that, the little mixtapes we yeah, had the mixtapes mix listening you know, to shit. showing us all those little things like that we could absorb the culture so that 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 was key sen how did you feel like you know because you came in the last few weeks of of the recording how did it feel like to up you know to raise up and you know being in our backyard recording and being comfortable to to now having to go to new york and and knock this this out uh I just remember a lot of mushrooms. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Making the album yes. so much as listening to the final product and all of a sudden the record was there. And I think that we we were high on mushrooms the day that we lit, did the playback and listened to the whole record. Right, the last right. day. We recorded yeah. We Ain't Going Out that day. Man, yeah, yeah. It was an experience to be able to go to New York and, you know, and live in New York for a minute and, and uh, 
and you know do the whole recording out there you know something you could say you did later on in life I, I it was, was dope man it's fucking cool remember the first time you came to new york with me you go hey homie does it always smell like this <laughs> 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 he's seen that he's the steam was coming out the street what the fuck's that street steam coming out the sidewalk for you know what was dope about that time though mugs is that we went and recorded this album in the winter mm -hmm. and although it's it's hard being you know in the east coast in the winter especially for west coast boys i i fucking absorbed that like yeah, i yeah. totally loved the vibe and you know but the driving on the icy roads was <laughs> something to get you something to get used to man to get, yeah, yeah. i remember our first day back we we got the rent a car and we were we were coming we were going into the city and you were driving and we hit he, we hit this curb just a little too fast and we slid into remember that we slid that into black the ice boy that, oh, shit that ain't black no ice joke. is crazy <laughs> bobo where were you at this time where was i where was bobo at this time <laughs> i know you were with the beasties at this point you know um i was i was hanging with sin a bunch and uh i remember uh when he he said yo you know you wanna you wanna hit a record and uh we drove around and that's when i first heard you know the black Sunday record hadn't done any really any gigs yet no 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 uh tours yet with with cypress we had just done the couple one uh, yeah, the, the el camino, el camino joints thing and, so yeah. uh and he just said yeah you know the thing about this song being uh the this first single i don't know but you know here it is and it was insane and i was like man i mean I knew there was something special about that record right right from the first listen and then a couple weeks later when it drops then all of a sudden it, it didn't stop from there yeah. like holy <laughs> shit and then to be a part of that you know that touring cycle for that record and everything was just like on express like yeah. everything it was shit like it was nuts there, there was so much stuff going on and being thrown at us and i'm like i just had to be there just like as a sponge and just absorb this shit because I did the stuff with the Beasties, but we hadn't done like what Cypress was doing, you know, at that time. So I was a sponge. So that's where that's where I was. I was just like, man, this is about to get crazy. I, I, I got to say, you know, like when 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 it came time to pick the single for the album, I think we all sort of wanted maybe we ain't going out like that or when the shit goes down or something like that. Um, but the label wanted insane, right? And I remember thinking, this is my album. I mean, it's a good song, but is it really our best one? It wasn't <laughs> the best song, but it was the single. It was like, it, uh, yeah. for me, it was like, um, I didn't feel the world heard our sound and got to like digest our sound yet. So that was like a continuation of Killer Man. The right. way it was put together, the way the answers, the, the yeah. third verse broke down and the, the, the call and responses in the chorus and, um, it was gangster as fuck, but it had a bounce to it. Like right. what the chorus was, was some gangster shit from, from the hood, right? Absolutely. Another thing, like usually we do extra songs for the record. This record, I think we only recorded like eight. We eight, yeah. Because we had um, Eight to the K was on What White Man Can't Jump. Right, and Hand on the Glock. Hand on the Glock was a remix. And then we had um, a couple, three interludes yeah. on the record, which made it like 12, 14 songs. But I think we just went and knocked eight, eight joints out. There was no extra right. joints on the record. Yeah, what, what, what you saw was what you got. And that was because of the rush and the fact that we were able to, you know, make what we made in those two, three months, as opposed to the five years it took us to make the first yeah, fucking yeah. album. That was crazy. But I'll say this, um, taking mushrooms to do We Ain't Going Out Like That was, was a, I think, was key. Like we, had, we hadn't done that before. I mean, we'd done mushrooms to party and we had done mushrooms on stage, you know, and, and done the doors. Jimi Hendrix style shit because we all grew up to that we all you know mutual fans of that but when we did the shrooms in the studio man that shit was crazy because it it like right when we start doing the verses is when it starts kicking in for me and I noticed when you know when we play it back like whenever we listen to the song or listen to the album there's a certain little grumble in our voices that aren't that isn't normally there and it was dope that you kept it right and then and like said you know what we need to redo this because y'all were you know too too much this day but like for some reason it fucking settled in 
and we heard the album, we turned the lights out, and a lot of people don't know this, but we used to turn the lights out at the end of sessions and listen to the shit, and it just sounded so fucking great while we were on Mushrooms. But I'll tell you what, you, you won up the whole album at the end, though, because when we got to Studio 4 in Philly, you created my favorite song on that album, which is fucking Lick a Shot. Mm, right you did right. lick a shot in philly in philly which was the very last song recorded for black sunday yeah once we finished the record and we would finish mixing and we had spare time then it was like let's see what we can do i'm like how, how many more records what can we record in this little bit of extra time i remember the first album we came up with um stone is the way of the walk the and, way, um, yeah. and ha um holding the head when the record was done we, re we, we did those so and this one was that so you know the record ain't done till it's till you have no more time, man. So just keep going until like that's it. Once you think it's done, if you got an extra week, just go experiment, man. But it doesn't feel like pressure when you do that, though, right? You know what I mean? Like, it's kind of like the job's done, and you just yeah. and you can just go yeah. come from a space of no with nothing. Right. Just no expectations anymore. Not trying to make an album. Just, not trying to get shit done. Just go yeah, create. Go. See what happens. Eight and how how much did the impact of that second album surprise you? Because I know with our first one, there was definite impact. It was like a, it was like a, not a slow movement, but it was like a moderate movement before it caught fire with Kill a Man. No, it was a while. It was a while. It was like, what, six months, maybe? Yeah, six months. We was out. We were only sold like a couple thousand records man yeah. we wasn't selling shit we were yet. pretty much dead in the water this, this record was when soundscan just started and i think we broke the soundscan record for rap groups we had like two hundred sixty thousand records the first week yeah. soundscan was new right yeah then we had two records in the top 100 on billboard yeah which was kind of some different shift for yeah, rap we, at the time yeah we were the first to hold that so how'd you feel about that impact sin i was i was just thinking about it man like that that album was a monster right out the gate uh, and it went places and did things. Um, <clears throat> and as far as like the impact goes, like, you know, we're still seeing proof of that today. <coughs> so. Yeah. yeah. And I noticed, <laughs> I noticed your level of weed smoke <laughs> went up too. You need a water. I got one. I remember last time this happened. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have a water last time. <laughs> It, it, it's crazy where this album took us though because i mean you know who you know like, I, I don't think any of us saw it. we were just kind of doing it mm. and, and you know we had the vision of what we wanted to do and we were just sort of making it happen so to, to when when it came out hearing like you know our friends back home all our homies telling us oh man there's lines around the block at all the record shops for your shit i mean that's not something I think any of us we anticipated that shit. Yeah. Now, we were just going from when that first record came out. We started that first promo tour. I think we were just nonstop for like four or five years. Yeah. And, you know, we just went yeah. tour back in the studio when we went home back on tour. And every time we came home, man, I was in the studio with either working on our shit, working on Cube, working on Funk Dubious, working on House of Pain. So it wasn't a break for me for like five years <laughs> until I was like, whoa, I'm dizzy. I'm going to sit down for a minute. Yeah. People, I, you know, people are unaware of our work ethic as a squad as a band and as individuals it sort of carries out you know through everybody's like individual shit the the, the work that we put in is serious you know mm -hmm. because we take what we love it but we take it serious you know what i mean mm -hmm. and it's it's a craft that you know if you put enough time into it it fucking develops and you came up with the sound like for every album Trying to come up with a different sound, man. That's I was inspired by Led Zeppelin just in the fact that they were always trying to go take this shit musically, someplace they never took it before, and just reach and bring different um, instrumentations and the different sound and the different style to each record. You know what I mean? And not stay the same and not just continue to make the same record over and over and over and over. So just challenge ourselves and keep pushing ourselves and, and stretching ourselves. I think we always did that shit. To this day, man, we still on that shit. Yeah, man. It's it's you know what. I'm excited about and uh, you motherfuckers should get excited about is, you know, flipping it into the symphony mm. like we had talked about. Like, it, who, who knew it all started from The Simpsons and then that became, it became a conversation. Yeah, the Simpsons go again, huh? Predicting the future. Predicting the future. You know, uh, this time we're not stealing a symphony from Peter Frampton. We're actually going to do it. 
Uh, I'm excited to, to, to hear how it translates. Mm. You know what I mean? Because it's a dark album. A lot of people don't understand. We just kept getting darker. We didn't like key in off of like the way that Insane was like, you know, popping like this. We sort of went darker instead of like following that. And I know that Sony wanted us to follow that because remember when we made Green Thumb, they were like, well, this could be like Insane. And I was like, well, yeah, we already got Insane. This is this. Um, but that was our mentality is, was to get darker as opposed to get brighter and louder and, and, and things like that. And, uh, but I'll tell you, man, Black Sunday, it's, it, you know, to me, it's gotta be one of the top 10 albums in, in hip hop history. I oh, think yeah. in my opinion, if I was a fan globally, that, that thing stretched this whole hip hop thing globally, like a motherfucker brought, brought hip hop places it was never at before. Oh yeah, like I remember my first time going into Bulgaria on a solo run, you know, and they were they were telling me, yo man, the first time we heard hip hop was Black Sunday. You know, some of them it was Temple of Boom, but a lot of them <coughs> caught on to Black Sunday. And uh, it's, it's, it's crazy seeing like how those songs move people. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's nuts, like still to this day. And you know, we brought that well, one thing, like when we came up, we was in the LL Cool J, we was in the Run DMC, we was in the, to the Beastie right. Boys, we was in the Public Enemy. And one thing they have in common was they harnessed a rock and roll energy. There was a certain energy where punk rock, rock, and they harnessed that shit. And That's we right. had that same energy. That's right. That's why we'd be on stage with, Met right, with, with a Metallica, with the PE, with the Slayer, with anybody, and be rocking it just as hard as them because our energy was fucking retarded. Yeah, you know, Black Sunday was the album that really like got the rock, rock audience kind of listening on huh? a little bit. You think? I think so. One hundred percent. Without trying, man. Yeah, 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 without trying. Shit. They just came this way. You know what I mean? But that's what Run DMC did, and fucking Public Enemy, and all the bands. You know that was yeah. came before us was like same shit. Rock and roll, motherfuckers was like this is raw shit right here. New. Everything was cutting edge. Everything was groundbreaking. Like all the groups I just named, they all had their own sound, their own style. You know, it wasn't no copycat of anything, right? Right. Yeah, you know, and that, and from from the album cover to even some of uh, the sounds that you used, you know, it just somehow impacted that that world, man. It's it's crazy. I was listening to a lot of Sabbath and um, Ministry, Al Jorgensen. Yeah, Ministry, yeah, that's right. You know, like some industrial, industrial rock shit. Yeah. So like I was like on that zone at that time. But but what did it feel like to like you know in the middle of that run come and start doing those shows playing those particular songs? Well, first of all, I was a fan, you know. I remember, you know, first seeing the Cypress at the uh, Lincoln Heights of this park, you know, and Kid Frost was performing, everything like that. Shit got cut short because somebody got stabbed Oops. in the crowd. But, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I was a fan, but I I knew that with, with, with the sounds of, I could hear myself of what I would play on it and, and, and to blend. I knew it was important to blend with what was already there and not overdo because you know it, it, that that's not what the hip hop thing was was about it was about you know being able to blend sounds and being a live musician up there you know it was it was about being able to use that musical you know know how to kind of blend in where it needed to be there I'll, I'll tell you this like black said they put us in a, a position to like blow bands out mm. <laughs> when we get up oh, there yeah. and rocking, we ain't going down. Lick a shot, um, insane in the brain. Those three, you know, were 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 would massacre other groups at that time. If you were coming on after That's us, hell of a combination, right there. Yeah, and I remember we were ending our shows with "We Ain't Going Out Like That," and the Saturday Night Live episode, right? It didn't necessarily go the way we had normally ran it with like tearing the set up. I wish motherfuckers had footage from that time with that. Like, cause, cause we were like, if I'm remembering correctly, we were doing the play off of what we had done in the insane in the brain video, yes. which no one had done before. Not yet. I mean, the beastie boys sort of did something like it, but like in terms of the, 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 the crowd surfing and the stage diving, you know, that had been done, but then at, at the end of the video, when we're smashing the turntables and we're like doing like the who did. Yeah, yeah. Right. Shit up. 
that became a thing. And that I think that's what sort of unlocked our wild ass fans because they saw that. They're like, we got to do that when we go see them play. And then, you know, keying in off of that, we start tearing our set up. Mm -hmm. And I think that was just like, it blew people's minds to see a hip hop group doing that. I had never seen a hip hop group do it. That's for that sure. And then when Cypress opened up for the Beasties and like every night, like breaking breaking up the turntable, I'm like, damn, how many turntables did these fools got? Yeah. They, they thought you was crazy. They're like, man, Bugs is killed. He could have gave me those turntables. <laughs> like every night, the damn. Well, you know, I guess we stopped after a while when I seen the bill. Yeah, the bill. <laughs> Like, oh, shit. You know what? We saw the bill, and because at first they were, you know, techniques, <laughs> we stopped doing it because it was expensive. But then I think you found, or I don't know who found it, but someone found a company with those plastic-ass turntables mm. that looked like the techniques, right? <laughs> and those were the ones you started tearing up after. Yeah. We would unplug the good ones, move them out of the way, and or something like that. It, there was something to it. But... It just visually, it was fucking awesome. When, whenever I would fucking see, the, you know, because everybody had the, the handheld cameras back we then. We did, we did. Whenever you'd see that go back, it's like, oh shit, was that, that looks crazy. Was that the time, were we still using DATS or did we bring the instant replay in? We were using time? DATS at that point. That's why you were un, you were able to unplug the turntable. Yeah, let the music still play. Let the music still the play. Mixer, yeah. And you would just take, you'd start with one turntable and we'd be fucking splashing that. And then the next one would come off. But by that time, because because if I'm remembering right, you would let the song end and then that second one would come flying mm -hmm. up. And then Bobo's shit would get smashed. The turntable, the so-called turntables would get smashed. And then it was just. When did you bring the, because Be Real was the first motherfucker ever to bring an instant replay. Nobody used instant replays to Be Real brought. He was doing radio and they used instant replays at the radio station. We had never seen them. We were still using Dats. And then Be Real one time brought the instant replay to do shows with. And I think everybody started seeing us use that shit. Yeah, I think everybody started fucking yeah. with the fucking instant no, replays. No, not all of the smoking grooves. Smoking grooves, yeah. yeah. You know what it was? Is, um, I think we, were, we, we did the radio in 96, 97. Yep. Yeah. We started the first Soul Assassin show on 92.3 The Beat. Mm -hmm. And thank you for letting us do that because, you know, we're running the flag up. Started in the Bay, though, at first, right? It started in the Bay, yes. We started weekends at the Bay, like on Sunday. We did a takeover for the Soul Assassin album, I think. Yeah. And then you guys started doing the show and killed that That's shit. Right. That's yeah. right. That's right. That was the, the, the seed, the origin of it. And we started doing uh, the Sunday shows with the Stevon cartoon. Ralph M, J. Turner, rest in peace, truly odd, and Bobo. And, uh, you know, we started there, then we brought it on over to LA mm. and did the Friday nights. And as I was doing the Friday nights, I went to go see the Baker boys to let them know, you know, because they were our boys, you know what I mean? And so I'm, I go there and I said, hey, you know, I'm thinking about doing this radio shit. What would I need? And I see their fucking system, the, the instant replay, and I notice a mix is happening, but neither of them are on the turntables and no one's on the turntables. And I'm like, where the, where the fuck is the mix coming from? Yeah, he's yeah, you're holding it together. You need a break. Pop, <laughs> hey, get some warm water for send dog. Pop, pop. Air. <laughs> and an oxygen mask. He's an oxygen mask. He's so, holding it. <laughs> <laughs> He's sweating. Here, take drink this. This will help the car. Here, get get give me a paper towel. Open that fucking window thing. <laughs> let's let's send dog out for a second. Oh boy, you all right, man? Man. <laughs> well, all right. We'll make it quick. We're almost done right here, dog. I feel like I'm in a sauna. <laughs> we sauna. Ooh. So I see this in replay, and I ask, "What's that?" They tell me that what all the shit it does, which is 24 at the time, 24 hours of recording time, right? I said, fuck, this would be perfect instead of using the DATs. And that's way it, better. Way better. Because I know we did a couple of shows and it was so fucking humid in the clubs that the DATs froze. Yeah. Yeah, the DATs would freeze. I mean, we went, a lot of people don't realize doing live shows, trying to like do it traditional style on turntables. 
if the stage wasn't steady or the fucking turntables weren't records steady. Records were jumping. Records jumping. And they got hype. That's you right. You don't know what stage you was on at what fucking college campus at right. what auditorium where you was and even the even the bass from the from the monitors would fuck with yeah, the turntables. Yeah, with the needle, yeah. And so we tried that a few times and when that record was just going like this the whole show, we was like, nah, we gotta flip this up to dats. Yeah, and then the dats in a humid a humidity uh, environment like a lot of humidity I get stuck it would get stuck um the instant replay didn't do any of that I mean it had its problems but we might have had a few where like a couple glitches those right not too much shit the wear and tear on it but those were fucking key for a long time and you know um and what Muggs was saying is people saw us using this like a lot of hip-hop heads DJs groups saw us using this thing and asked us about it and then all of a sudden you see all these groups go towards the, the instant replay we don't get the credit for it an instant replay should be thanking us for that mm. boom but they never have and it's okay because we use serato now <laughs> which allows you to go back <laughs> to the yeah. traditional aspect of it hey how do you like that aspect of it i now, love it man i love it better than carrying all them fucking plates yeah right? it made me want to start djing again just because it was simplified but i didn't have to carry all these records go buy these records shop for shit look for yeah, shit yeah. it was just kind of right there yeah. and i was like okay now I, I didn't have time to do all that shit now but this shit is fun again look at it i got yeah, everything man. on my fingertips fucking serato i love it um send off oh, you've been Pop. killing it too lately oh thank I see you, you bro hey Woo! you started me off you allowed it's, me to i don't fuck know if you've seen b <laughs> on the turntables lately but he's fucking tight as fuck hey it all started when you would allow me to get on your turntables whenever you go to new york when you were on kingsley and every other fucking place that, did that i leave him at your at. house for a while yeah in your oak with the, my radio yeah and you showed in, me in the Gardena. cut on the one and the snare and that that's where it started me out and so thank you for that yes, sir Sin dog, what happened to your Raiders, bro? Uh, you know, uh we have a uh, <laughs> we got problems. Uh, uh, problems. We have a uh, shit for an owner, shit for a coach. So it all starts upstairs, and uh, the product on the field is what you get when you uh, don't take care of business upstairs. So see how he snapped out of him real quick. He started talking sports and. <laughs> The sports cast uh, send dog jumps off. By the way, Derek Carr signed with the Saints today. So. Did he? Yeah, he's gonna win now. Who the so, Raiders? Yeah, thanks for asking, man. Uh, I'm actually a fan of the Las Vegas Vipers. The Vipers. The Vipers. XFL team. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh yeah. New team. Yeah. yeah. The team. Rock and the his Rock. ex-wife. Yeah. Uh, they bought the XFL. The Vipers. And wow. uh, they're putting forth the league now. Like the XFL. Yeah. Well, it's real football again? Yeah. yeah. Close lines and everything. Back to the 50s, huh? Doing it. With some, yeah. some more innovations like they, they came out with last time. Again, they like changed the, the game work. again. Yeah, right? Oh, yeah. I'll tell you what. That, that XFL was definitely innovative with the camera work. That wire cam shit they came up with now every sport. What, what, what was the rules that were different in that league, son? Smaller field too, right? No. no, it's the same. But they're the ones that invented that swinging camera. Right. Yeah. The camera on that road deal, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then the NFL used that. NBA uses it. I mean, like, that. Remember the USFL? Yeah, the USFL. USFL for a few years. Is the USFL coming back or? It's back already. Yeah. It was like three football <laughs> Football's everywhere, shit. Well, there's, we're, there's too much football. When we were in Mexico, they got a football league down there. It, yeah. It, I can't remember what it was called, but yeah, the motherfuckers is playing football everywhere now. You must love that shit, Sen Dog. The fact right. that football is spread everywhere. I know you're having a hard time <laughs> in the back the of the box. Yeah, the <laughs> what the fuck do you want? I want your lighter. Yeah. You're not using it. <laughs> it's somewhere on the fucking floor. Man, we used what to do this all sweat. the time. Papa, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was 30 years ago. That was 30 years ago. Right? Fair enough. That's why we're celebrating this shit right here. Yeah, it's comedy. And you, man, your little, um, remember the little beamer you had, the brown one? Yeah. yeah the wow. bail up in that motherfucker. <laughs> that, that was a clean, clean little beamer right there. It was a, you know, it had a nice little song, sound system. That, you know, that was, that was a key part, I think, too, of, 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 um, 
the ending of every album is like getting into the car, listening to it, blazing yeah, a blunt, yeah, yeah. and listening to it in the system. The car test. The car test. Everything. If it didn't sound good in the car, we'd be back in the studio fix, tweaking shit. I don't think motherfuckers do that anymore. Like these new these new producers, I don't think they do that because you sometimes you hear this shit. And it's real gainy on the radio or on one of the streaming. It's like they didn't give it the fucking car test. Mm. Like if your speakers, right, are fucking rattling in in the bad way, <coughs> and you got a stop system, that's that shit ain't fucking. They didn't do they didn't do the car test. Uh, no. Nope. And we fuck we would live by that. I remember going out right after a mix would happen. You know, before you made it final or whatever, we'd go and fucking listen to it. And if if there was no whip available, you know, you always had the shittiest little speakers. Like, what were they called? When it sounds good in the shitty speakers in the car, it's going to sound good in the studio, right? When yeah. it sounds good in shitty speakers and in the car and another car, you know, you got a good mix. Did you it's try consistent it? consistent everywhere. With you, did you try it like a different thing, like the boom box? Yeah, I would, you, I, I, would, I would listen to it in the car. And then, you know, the boom box. But then I remember being in this, after we mixed one time, Joe the Butcher put it on his little speaker. And I was like, why are you, he had the little ones and then the little one, just the single one. I go, why is that? He goes, that's what it's going to sound like on TV. Yep. And I was like, oh shit. Oh, that's yeah. a gem right you there. You know what I mean? This was not this, the fucking um, systems we have now. It was just, you had right, your little right, TV right. with the little speaker. There was no stereo. So you hear it come out of that. And he's like, that's how your video is going to sound. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, you couldn't you couldn't listen to the mix on someone's blown out ass system because it do that. wouldn't sound right. So from that day on, take it around and try it in a few different things. Make sure the consistency is there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You dial in. I want to say one last thing before you know we we end end this right quick because it i think it has to be said i want to pay respects to to jack Herrera who gave us a lot of game yes, for that album and we did something groundbreaking on that album like in many ways not just the the record sales and the chart the chart um positions and all that because we broke a lot of records with that um but what we also did was give information that was not available to people previously. You know, people have been being washed with the anti-cannabis propaganda, the, what was that shit called? Um, Reefer Madness and all this and stuff. And we got mentored by a man named Jack Herrera, legend in the cannabis industry as an advocate and activist for cannabis. And uh, a lot of the information that we put on that album came from his book, Emperor Wears No Clothes. That was very important yeah, to yeah. us in our advocacy for legalization and look here we are in california it's legal and soon i feel like in the next 10 years federally legal pretty soon yeah it's coming i'll get there i think jack you know he would have been proud but he would also still be fighting for fairness because there's a lot of unfairness in the industry but i gotta say that album helped open the doors to legalization for sure industry huh yep yeah, Gentlemen, yeah. I want to thank y'all for sitting in the box to celebrate our Black Sunday 30 year anniversary. Um, y'all are fucking legends. My brothers. You too, my brother. My family. Yeah, yeah. And it's only right. And we want to thank the fans out there for holding this album up yeah. in the time that it came out all the way up to now. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it, it did a lot of great things for us. And that means y'all did a lot of great things for us. And... We appreciate it from the top. You guys want to give any shout outs before we finish? So Thank you. Thank you for all shout the Shout out to everybody. You know what I mean? Could have done it without the fans, loyal following and and uh, support. So big up. Thank you very much. Word up. Check us out. Coming up with that Symphony Black Sunday flipped. All right. So get ready for it. And, uh, you know, we're always going to keep making music. So uh, keep your ears open. Um, We got a lot to drop still all right so keep mm -hmm. smoking that good good treat yourself right treat others right keep loving your heart um believe in yourself and smoke that good always no boof ever leave a comment subscribe to the channel fuck with dj mugs send dog eric bobo and uh Be real right here and let's keep it rolling all right this has been another smoke box for Be real tv yeah. That was a good one. We got to retrain Send Dog, but you know, hey, it was awesome. Oh, oh man. <laughs>
It was great, man. I felt just at home, man. I don't know about Sin, dog. We got to get him back up to speed. I don't know what happened with that. He was sweating. <laughs> Buddy. Buddy. A fan roll joint. That's a five. <laughs> That's a three. <laughs> Boom! With some mash, look. Double stamps. <laughs> On the Y. Why Certified. Not? Certified. Got the heart of a lion. Soul of a titan.